Whew, that was a long nap. Anyway, let's do some physics. So far, we've learned the math that relates how objects move and what happens when forces act on objects. But now, we've come to a point where we need a way to measure how much movement is really occurring in a system. This unit, whatever it is, has to be proportional to both the mass of an object and its velocity. The simplest way we could construct such a measure is to just multiply an object's mass times its velocity. In fact, in French, momentum is called quantité de mouvement, which literally means amount of movement. Since velocity is a vector, momentum is as well. An object has momentum in a particular direction. In this way, it acts kind of like velocity itself. Since we're multiplying mass with velocity, the units of momentum are kilograms times meters per second. We can also see that if we increase the mass of an object, or its velocity, or both, momentum goes up. This is a good illustration of what momentum is actually measuring. Now, just like a force changes the velocity of an object, the momentum of an object can be changed by an impulse. Simply put, an impulse measures a change in momentum. The momentum of an object can be changed by applying a force to it over some period of time. Thus, impulse is force times time. But this begs the question, if we already have force, why do we need impulse? Well, in the same way that momentum is an amount of movement, an impulse is an amount of force. Force by itself is an instant thing. It's used to measure what's happening to an object at a discrete, singular point in time. But in the real world, nothing is exerted instantly. Impulse takes into account the whole time a force was exerted onto an object from start to finish. If the same amount of force is exerted onto an object for a longer amount of time, it'll lead to a bigger change in that object's behavior. Thus, we multiply force with time to get impulse, which measures the entire effect of the force on the object. Thus, the area under a graph of force with respect to time will be the impulse exerted. So, we see that impulse is simply a change in momentum. This is summarized by the impulse momentum theorem. The change in momentum is equal to the force times the change in time. Thus, momentum and impulse both have the same units. We can consider the momentum of an entire system of objects by adding all the momenta of the individual objects tip to tail, just like we do with force. This gives us the net momentum of a system, just like adding all the forces gives us the net force. For example, if a system consists of two objects moving towards the right, their momentum will also be a vector pointing to the right. But if we have two objects of the same mass heading towards each other at the same speed, the momentum of the system will be zero. In this last example, we can see that although the objects in the system are both moving, something about the system is staying in the same place. This thing is called the center of mass. We measure it by calculating the average position of each object weighted by their mass. This makes sense. The heavier an object is, the more it pulls the center of mass towards itself. The center of mass is kind of like the average position of everything in the system. We can think of a system of some composite object that's located at the center of mass, with a mass equal to the total mass of the system. This object obeys Newton's laws, including Newton's second law, F equals ma. Since impulse is calculated with force, we could use Newton's second law to calculate the effect of an impulse on the system. Last video, we learned about Newton's first law, namely that the path of an object will change if and only if a force is exerted on it. It turns out that there's a similar law for momentum. The momentum of a system will change if and only if an external impulse acts on it. This law is called the conservation of momentum and is the first of many conservation laws you'll see in AP Physics. When the members of a system don't interact, conservation of momentum follows directly from Newton's first law, since the objects will just keep on their original trajectories. However, the velocities of objects can change within the system, namely if they collide or bounce off of each other. When this happens, their speeds, and thus their momenta, may change since they exert an impulse on each other. But the conservation of momentum guarantees that the momentum of the whole system itself stays exactly the same. This means that if we know the masses and initial speeds of all the objects in a system, we know the momentum of the system as well. So, if two objects collide and we know the final velocity of one, we can calculate the final velocity of the other, since the momentum before the collision and after the collision has to be the same. We can also connect this idea to the center of mass. In a moving system, the velocity of the center of mass will only change when an external impulse acts on the whole system itself. If the only changes to a system are internal, like a collision, 
the path of the center of mass won't be affected at all. Suppose we have a 5 kilogram bowling ball rolling down a lane at 10 meters per second. At the end of the lane, it hits a 2 kilogram bowling pin, which flies off at 15 meters per second at an angle of 30 degrees. What is the velocity of the bowling ball after this collision? Well, we haven't been told that the ball or the pin have broken, so we can assume that the mass of the ball and the pin stay the same before and after the collision. First, we calculate the initial momentum of the system. Since the bowling pin isn't moving at the start, this is simply the momentum of the ball. By conservation of momentum, the system must also have this momentum after the collision. We can use this to isolate the final speed of the ball. Right now, we're using momentum in two different directions to calculate the speed. We'll need to separate these out into their components to calculate the final momentum. This example illustrates how momentum gives a framework for figuring out what happens after collisions. Wow.